How many of you guys enjoy the donuts today? Yeah. Enjoy them this month. Next month, we're going to call the sermon series Diet Plan. Okay. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for, for your spirit. I thank you for your life. I thank you for, for the love that you've given us. And Father, I pray that we know that you are here. We know that your spirit is in this place. But I pray that you would speak and that we would hear it. And Lord, I, I also pray that you would help us to understand what it is you're trying to express to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So this series is obviously called Donuts, which by the way, that is a, a, an actual spelling of donuts for those of you who might have a problem with it not being spelled the long way. This is Dunkin' Donuts version, so it must be right. But uh, that is a legitimate spelling for it. And you may have walked in asking, you know, what in the world do donuts and pastries have to do with Jesus and the Bible? Well, other than the Bible saying, taste and see that the Lord is good, I'm not quite sure. But it's worth it. <laughs> um, really what we're talking about, though, is not, it's a little different. It's two words put together, and it's do and not. So donut. And... Uh, you might be thinking, well, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the law, or we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments, or what to do and what not to do, and, and that's not really the, the thing we're looking at. We're going to start looking at, we're going to be looking at precepts and ideas and concepts of God and, and things like that. And matter of fact, today, we are looking, what we're talking about today is do not forget, do not forget, or do not forget the promises and the love and the grace of God. And this is very, very important to understand this because I think a lot of times we get wrapped up in what we do and who we are and, and doing the thing that sometimes we miss why we do it and why we, why we are here. Why are we here? Why are we here on a Sunday morning? I mean, come on. Spending our time. Spending our effort, our energy, is it because we think it's the right thing to do and it's culturally right or correct or relevant? Or, or is it because, because we love God and we know that God loves us? So today is really, really what this is, what this is about is not forgetting who God is, not forgetting his love for us and his grace for us and his promises. Psalms 103, this is a psalm that was written by King David. And I know growing up, I was told that Psalms was written by King David, but he wrote most of them or a lot of them. And uh, he didn't write every single one of them, but this one was, particularly, was specifically written by him. As a matter of fact, when you read the subtitle of it, it says, A Psalm of David. And so it was written by King David. And the belief is, or the under, our understanding is, that it was written towards the end of his life. And... So David had already gone through his life. He had already defeated the giant. He had already, he had already come into to his kingship. He had already had an affair and killed the man who was married to the woman in order to cover it up. He had already um, seen his kingdom fall or be split and divided by his son and he, as he tried to usurp David's authority. And then David is now looking at the end of his days, and he's going through this, and this is what he says. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all of your iniquities, who heals all of your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like eagles. Anybody in this room need their youth renewed like eagles? Like they just need their youth renewed. They need the, the zeal, the excitement, the dreams, the passions, the fire that burned inside of them. Who would love to have that renewed? I mean, even it doesn't even matter if you're in your 20s. There's a part of you that, that is starting to die. That youth part of you is starting to die. Remember as a kid, you go out in the backyard and you could spend two hours playing with a stick. I mean, you think, I watch my kids do this. And they're like, they got a stick. And I'm like, what are you doing? They're waving around, running around. They're, one minute it looks like they're holding it up as a flag or a banner. The next minute they're, they're fighting, sword fighting with it. The next minute they're, I don't know what they're doing, fishing with it, you know. But 
the youth, the, the zeal, the excitement for life. I know me, I could use it renewed. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He has made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. Isn't it good to know that God doesn't deal with you according to your sins? I mean, because he could... Destroy us just for one sin. He has the right, but he chooses not to. He chooses to love us anyway. He chooses to, to love us when we mess up. Anybody in this room have kids? <laughs> like most of the place, right? Anybody in this room have kids that have screwed up? And you are ready to smite them yourself. Yeah. But God doesn't deal with us according to our sins, nor does he... Reward us according to our iniquities, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so as loving kindness is towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he re has he removed our transgressions from us, just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he is mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass, and as a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind passes over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting to those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember his precepts to them. The Lord has established his thrones in the heavens, and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, Mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you host, you who serve him, doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his, and in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. And if you read this scripture, most of it has exclamation points. Like, you're supposed to be shouting this from the rooftop. Like, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Like, God is amazing. God is awesome. Stand in awe of him. Express that. But what is the Bible really saying here? It's Jesus' way or God's way of saying, do not forget how much I love you. Do not forget the promises that I have for you. Do not forget who I am and allow yourself to in, be embraced by me and loved by me. Allow yourself to be enraptured by me because I am enraptured by you. I am overwhelmed. Jesus, God himself is overwhelmed by who you are. And the other side of this is this also saying, stop pretending like you understand the full extent of my grace and my love and my mercy and who I am. Stop it. Stop pretending like you've got me all figured out because you don't. Because there are times when I've done things that you have no idea about. There are times when I've moved on your behalf that you have no clue about. There are times that I've done things that you don't understand. Saying that we understand the full capacity and the full grace of God and the full loving kindness of God is like taking this mug and going up on a boat to Niagara Falls and sticking this under the falls saying we're going to catch every piece of water, every drop of water that falls off of this fall. That's not going to happen. Anybody in here been to Niagara Falls? That's not going to work. That's not going to cut it. But this is our capacity to understand who God is. And we sit here and we go, well, God, I got you figured out. I understand this. God's like, no, you don't. You don't even know the half of what I've done. But at the same time, we take this cup or this mug of our lives and we say, God, I'm going to revel in the grace that you've given me that I understand. I'm going to revel in it, and I'm going to enjoy it, and I'm going to be enraptured by it. According to Revelation 2, 3 through 4, this is an interesting scripture. And when i putting this in here, I was like, wow, this, this really does work. But Jesus, at this point in time, he's talking to, to John. 
And Jesus has already gone up to heaven. So John's having a vision of Jesus. And, and Jesus is there talking to him and communicating and saying, I want you to write a letter to these different churches. And each one of these churches represent, it was a real church. They were real churches in John's day and age. But at the same time, they represent an attitude in the church that is today. And they represent attitudes in the church that are going to be existent in the last days. Okay, so when Jesus comes back. And what he says is he starts listing off for this particular church. He says, you know, he starts listing off all these good things they've done, these great exploits. And he's like, I'm so glad you've done this, you've done this, and you've done that. And then, and then Jesus goes on to say, starting in, in uh, verse 3, and you have perseverance and endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. That's a good thing. You've held on. And then Jesus says a very key word, but... Whenever, see, whenever you see Jesus say, but, you can almost circle that in your Bible because that's an attitude that needs to be changed. He says, but, but, I have this against you. You have left your first love. What is he really saying? He's saying, that we can do all kinds of good, but if we forget who he is and his love for us, then a change must occur. Anybody in here ever forgotten an anniversary? Don't be afraid to admit it because you know your spouse already knows, <laughs> unless it's today. What about a spe special someone's birthday, like a special friend or a wife or a kid or a spouse or something, you forgot their birthday? Anybody ever done that? That's bad, right? Especially kids, they let you know. <laughs> but you know what's even worse is imagine this. Your spouse remembers your anniversary. He says, here you go, honey. Here's your present. By the way, I don't love you anymore and I don't think you love me anymore. That's terrible. You got to get that love right. Or here's your birthday present, but I don't think we're going to hang out anymore. What Jesus is saying is thanks for the gift, but you've stopped loving me. You've stopped loving me. You've stopped doing these things because you care about who I am and you care about the fact that I love you. And You've just started doing them because you do them and you think they're the right thing to do. So how do we get back to the place where we're in love with him? The first thing we need to do is we need to remember that he first loved us. There's a story in the Bible as a perfect example of this. Jesus was having dinner with a Pharisee. He had been invited over to the Pharisee's house and he was having dinner with him and he was reclining at the table and in walks very unceremoniously outside of etiquette, outside of protocol, outside of everything you could imagine. Propriety walks in a prostitute. And she unashamedly falls at Jesus' feet. And she begins to start weeping on his feet. And, and her tears start to soak his skin and saturate his, his feet. And, and, and I don't know if you understand this, but Jesus, if you were here last week, Pastor Dan showed everywhere where Jesus walked, all those places that Jesus walked. Anybody remember that? Well, he showed, he walked up into Syria and he did all this walking and Jesus did not have cross trainers. He wore sandals and sometimes he probably went barefoot. And another thing they didn't have in those days was they didn't have planes, trains, and automobiles. They had camels. 
and donkeys and horses, stray dogs, people walking that they didn't have public restrooms either. So they would just pop a squat. And so you have all of this filth on the dirt and on the ground and, and it's covering things. And, and so they're walking in all of this muck and this mire and all this grotesqueness. And the woman comes and she falls at Jesus' feet and she begins to weep and then she begins to dry his feet with her hair. And then she begins to kiss his feet. And Jesus, knowing that Jesus has been walking, knowing that Jesus has been doing all these things, she understands that and she unashamedly begins to kiss his feet. And I thought it was funny because as I read this scripture this time, I, I actually started crying and tearing up, but, but I, I realized something that I hadn't really noticed before was, was that she, when she came in and she was crying and she was doing those things, I used to think she cried a little bit, dried his hair, kissed his feet, they put some perfume on there. But it says that she kept doing this. She kept crying. She kept drying his feet. She kept kissing his feet. She didn't stop. So that means she was weeping these tears and these tears were tears of, of grief, of bitterness, of, of pain and frustration, of shame for who she was. And then she looked at his feet and she realized, it's almost like she realized, oh my gosh, I can't leave that on there. My tears aren't even worthy of touching his nasty feet. So I have to dry it off somehow. And the only thing I know to do is use my hair. And so I'm gonna use my hair because I'm filthy anyway, so I'm gonna put the filth back on myself and I'm gonna take it off the Son of God. And then she begins, Oh my gosh, he's not pushing me away, so I'm going to start kissing his feet because he is not ashamed of me. And so she starts kissing his feet and starts embracing it. And Jesus is sitting there. All this is going on. And there's a Pharisee, the Pharisee sitting across the table. And you have to understand this. The Pharisee says, in the Bible, it says, the Pharisee said to himself. So Jesus didn't hear him. The Pharisee says this. He says, if this guy was truly a prophet, if he was who he really claims he is, in other words, he was mocking him, he would know what kind of filth is touching him. He would know what kind of woman this is. And he would push her away. And Jesus turns to him without hearing what he said in the natural, turns to him and says, hey, I want to tell you a story. Okay, sure. There's these two guys and they had borrowed money from the same lender. And the lender gave a little bit of money to the first guy. And then he gave like 50 times as much to the second guy. And he decided that he is going to forgive the debt, that he's gonna just make it clean. He said, you don't owe me any money. And Jesus goes, which one do you think loved the lender more? And the Pharisee thought for a second. He said, well, I would imagine that the guy who owed the most money loved him more. And Jesus said, you'd be right. And he follows this up with this statement. Do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven a little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. 
And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man that even he forgives sin? He's got no right to do that. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. What Jesus was saying here was she understands grace. She understands love and compassion. She understands needing God. And you, my friend, my religious friend who grew up in the, in the temple or in today's world will be the church, who, who grew up studying the word of God, who, who spent all this time in it, you've forgotten grace. You've forgotten love. You've forgotten compassion. You've forgotten who I am. He has forgotten. See, the Pharisees were designed and set in place to, to say to the world, hey, guess what? Here's the Messiah. He fulfills the prophecies. He fulfills what's supposed to happen. Here he is. And they got so wrapped up in doing the religious thing that even when Jesus was standing in front of them, they missed God. And Pharisees, they get a bad rap. But this guy, I can imagine when he was young, he went into the ministry and he was fired up about it. He was passionate about who God is and was and trying to understand God and trying to learn about him and trying to, to do things that, that would, would just endear God to himself and endear God to other people. He wanted to show people who God is. However, throughout this whole time, He's lost that passion and that fire because he forsake or forsook his first love. He lost sight of who God is. And Jesus was saying, this woman, she sees me for who I am. See, when we forget the love of God, we cheapen grace and we defile the gospel. When we forget the love of God, we cheapen grace and defile the gospel. It's a terrible thing to do. You know, over 100 years ago, in the deep south, I mean, we're in the south, but we're talking the deep south here. They didn't say, I was saved or I'm born again. What they said when they came to know Jesus was, I have been seized by the power of great affection. I've been seized by the power of great affection. Doesn't that sum up what happens when you come to know Jesus and you realize who he is? You realize you've been seized by this power. It's taken a hold of you. Not just any power. It's the power of being loved and endeared to someone. It is the power of being look, someone looking at you and being like, I love you beyond a shadow of a doubt. I have affection for you. I have a love for you that is beyond comprehension. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says this, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God with him. When we realize that Jesus came and was filled, made himself filthy for us and we embrace that, we become the righteousness of God. How many people in this room today that are followers of Christ can say that you walked in here with a confidence that you are the righteousness of God? Do you feel like the righteousness of God? I got upset at my kids last night. I lost my mind on my kids last night. Guess what? Then I had to come here and preach. And I did not feel like the righteousness of God until I remembered that it's the grace of God. It is the love of God. It's not about what I do that makes me the righteousness of God. You, followers of Jesus Christ, are the righteousness of God. You can say that with confidence. Why? Because, one, the Bible says it, but because Jesus allowed his feet to become filthy for you and me. He allowed his being to become filthy. What this scripture is really saying is that his filth that he put on himself is worse than yours. That's weird to think about. He made himself dirtier than us. He put, us, put himself lower than us so that we become his righteousness.
And when we start to grasp that and we start to understand that, there are benefits that occur in our lives. When you start to understand the grace of God and that he has created you and made you and be brought you into being the righteousness of God, there are some benefits that happen. One, freedom from all kinds of bondage. You know, we talk a lot about spiritual bondage and being free from that. You know, I'm saved from hell and all that stuff. But here's the reality of it. Jesus came to set us free. Free from all kinds of things. You know, if, if we trust God, there's a possibility that, you know, you struggle mentally. God can set you free from mental struggles. He can set you free from that bondage. He can set you free from the bondage of feeling like you have to perform. Of feeling like you have to be something that you're not. The free, he can give you freedom from peer pressure. Yeah, I know, we're a bunch of adults in here. We don't have peer pressure. Yes, we do. But God can set us free from that. He can set us free from the, the fear of, of being of a failure. He can set us free from emotional fears. He can set us free from an emotional bondage. God can set you free from all kinds of things. You know, I used to wonder how people could lay their lives down for the message of Jesus Christ. There was a young lady, her name was Rachel Scott. She, she died in um, one of the first school shootings, major school shootings in the United States in Columbine. And I remember this. I mean, school shootings happen all the time right now. But this was one of the first ones, and so it was really highlighted in my mind. And she was outside of her school, and the, the guys who came in to, to shoot up the school shot, shot her in the leg. And she's laying on the ground bleeding. And they said, well, do you still believe that Jesus is God? And she said, yes, yes, I do. And he says, go and meet him. She had a choice. And she chose to say that she would die for Christ. And she's not the first. She's not the only one. She's not going to be the last. The answer, though, is that they realized that they were filthy without Jesus, and he made them righteous. It's all because of Jesus. They realized that Jesus is the center of it all, and they remembered the love of God. They never forgot. They did not forget the grace of God, and they were overwhelmed by who he is and what he's done. And the second thing, second benefit that happens is faith is renewed daily. You know, Scripture says that God's mercies are new every day. I'll be honest with you. There are days that I wake up and I don't feel like God's mercies are very new. But I have to recenter myself. And when I do, I realize that God, God makes everything new every day. When we remember the love of God, not only, not only do, do we feel that his mercies are renewed every day, but we no longer seek the miracles and the powers of God. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to lay hands on the sick and have them recover or to raise the dead and to do those kind of things? But here's the deal. Jesus says that an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. In other words, when you seek the signs instead of the one who is the giver of the signs, then you're setting up an idol. You're setting up a false God. So when we learn, when we have our faith renewed daily, we no longer seek those miracles and gifts. We begin to seek his unfailing presence. We seek the presence of God because he becomes our obsession. He becomes who, who we want to be like. He becomes what we want. We could care less about the gifts. That just begins to flow because we are so centered on Jesus. But the gifts begin to flow out and things begin to happen. Crazy things happen when you seek the unfailing presence, the unrelenting presence of God. And the third thing that happens is faith is destroyed. The Bible says that perfect love casts out all fear. I mean, how can we know that? Because here's the thing, when you realize that Jesus is working about his will in the earth, and he is doing his thing in the earth, that when you hear stuff that happens today, you're no longer afraid because you realize that ultimately the things that are happening in the earth are about 
God bringing about his ultimate will, which his ultimate will is what? To bring his kids home. It is about us being embraced by him. The followers of Jesus Christ being embraced by him. When you realize that you're no longer afraid when you see the signs of the times. You're no longer concerned when you start hearing about earthquakes and wars and those kind of things. You're no longer gripped with fear because you realize that it's God bringing about his will in the earth. When we remember that God's love is the key to bringing his will in the earth, we become the prostitute made right. We become the filthy made clean. We are no longer the false religious teacher. We are no longer the religious person. We are the ones who are filthy, dirty, and stained, and we are set free. And God looks at us and he says, your faith has set you free. Your faith has made you whole. May we be that prostitute, that woman of the night who says, Jesus, I need you. And may we never cheapen grace. You guys, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'm going to pray for two specific groups of people in this room. And I'm going to ask you guys to have some courage. The first group I'm going to pray for are the, the people who maybe have grown up in the religious circle all their lives. And they've kind of lost that fire. They've become the Pharisee. They become the man who, who says, I gotta, I'm doing what I can to do things right, to make it happen. I'm gonna pray that God sets you free from that. And then the second group I'm gonna pray for is the one who walked in the room today and they feel filthy. They feel undeserving of God. They feel like the prostitute. And I'm gonna pray that God sets you free from your shame and from your fear and your rejection. And then if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, I'm gonna ask you to do something really courageous. If you slip up your hand to say that I, I'm the prostitute and I've never asked Jesus into my heart, I'm gonna ask you to go after we're done praying and go over there to the sign that says baptism and get baptized because she was unashamed. She fell at the feet of Jesus. She didn't let anything stop her. And there's nothing to stop you. We have clothes, we have towels, we have everything back there that you need. So there's nothing to be afraid of. Let's just do it. Let's just fall at the feet of Jesus today. Whether you're the Pharisee or the prophet, I mean the prostitute, let's fall at the feet of Jesus. And let's pray. Jesus, I just pray right now that your spirit would begin to move, that you begin to do something, that you would begin to stir in our hearts, you would reveal who you are and who we are in this whole scenario. Right now, just quicken to our hearts and our minds. Quicken this. If you feel like today that you are the Pharisee, you are the one who, who has been religious, done the religious thing, and you've lost your zeal, you've lost your passion for God, you've forgotten the love of God, I want you to slip up your hand right now. Just slip it up high so I can see it because everybody's eyes should be closed. Okay, we're gonna pray for you guys. Lord Jesus, I pray for the Pharisees in the room, the ones who just slipped up their hands and said, I've lost my my love for God. I, I feel like that I've forgotten the love of God. I pray that right now you would ignite that fire in them again, that you would ignite it in them right now in the name of Jesus. Ignite the Holy Spirit in them. Ignite a desire for your presence. Burn in them your love and your compassion and your fortitude and your faith and your grace. Lord God, make it consume them in the name of Jesus. Now, if you feel like the prostitute today, the one who who is hurt and rejected and, and just feels unworthy of God, feels filthy and dirty, uh, slip your hand up. Slip it up high, don't be ashamed. She was not ashamed. Lord Jesus, I pray for the ones who've slipped up their hands right now, the ones that claim that they feel like they are unworthy of you. Lord, that they are filthy and they are dirty and they need to make their lives right. They're falling at your feet today and they're weeping at your feet today. God, I pray that you would cleanse them right now and you would restore them as they would see that their faith has made them whole. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have never asked Jesus in your heart and today is the first day when you said, I admit that I am the prostitute, if you, please have the courage. Go over there right now and have the courage to be baptized. You are dismissed. Thank you.